first of all, I would like to thank you and the Popov Initiative to give me this opportunity to talk about my research and as well to support this very large research project. Our overall research aim is to analyze in depth the largely unexplored role of migration as a strategy to deal with health-related risks. And we know that those risks are among the most severe risks faced by poor households. So in fact, we address two separate questions. So the first one, do the low availability and poor quality of healthcare facilities force uh, people in need for care to uh, move to far away locations with better health provisions? And uh, this is particularly important in rural areas of sub-Saharan countries because uh, most of the poor people live in isolated areas and live very far away from hospitals. So the second question concerns the very complex links that exist between migration and infectious diseases. And uh, it is very well known that migration, among other factors, contributes to the spread of disease. But now what is much less known is how migration, in turn, may respond to infectious diseases. And uh, our research that studies the two-way relationship between migration and in infectious disease uh, showed that this has, in fact, very important health and economic consequences. We have analyzed data from a household survey on health and economic outcomes of households living in a very deprived area of Nigeria in Kwara State. And uh, the key findings is, first of all, it's obvious that individuals uh, travel far away in order to seek for care, and on average between 15 to 25 kilometers, depending on the uh, health uh, problem. And uh, in particular, poor households travel much further away than rich households. And uh, we can see that individuals in the poorest quintile, in fact, travel twice as much as individuals from the richest quintile. And this, of course, has important uh, economic consequences since they spend more on transportation costs, both as a share of their budget, but as well uh, in absolute terms. And uh, we also try to explain how these people choose between different types of healthcare, and in particular, how uh, they choose between uh, traditional uh, care, self care, and more formal healthcare like uh, hospitals, private clinics, uh, doctors, and so on. So uh, what we show is that maybe as everybody is expecting, the price of the healthcare, the quality of healthcare and the distance are among the main determinants explaining those choices. And what is very uh, important to, to highlight as well is that we see evidence that women and especially older women uh, are discriminated in terms of utilization of formal healthcare. And we find as well uh, evidence uh, of gender discrimination against uh, young girls below, the, below five years old. My research with Paul Seabright departs from the abundant historical evidence showing that endemic diseases such as malaria affect individuals' location decisions. And for example, we know that the Pilgrim Fathers have decided to settle into the US rather than to Guyana because of the very high mortality rates characterizing uh, like in, uh, in Guyana. And uh, we also know that uh, very often people uh, have moved and have responded very strongly to epidemic disease. So after the, after the outbreak of epidemics such as the Black Death, or much more recently, after the SARS uh, epidemic, many people have moved and have tried to escape the epicenter of the disease to move into neighborhood villages, in the case of the Black Death, or into rural uh, villages or rural neighborhood uh, after the SARS epidemics. So this also justified the implementation of very strict quarantine measures, since people fleeing the epicenter of the disease were putting other people at risk. Okay, but our research shows that, in fact, uh, this strong quarantine measure may have unintended consequences, which are to increase the overall rate of disease instead of decreasing it.
Okay, so the key point here is that there are some economic mechanisms that may lead individuals of different types to live in two different areas. And this kind of sorting may be beneficial in terms of global health. So let me explain with a simple example. So imagine uh, that an individual lives in a city with a healthy environment, where the prevalence rate of disease is close to zero. Now, if this individual acquires a disease, she will impose a very strong externality in this city. So by externality, we mean that this individual is going to infect many individuals in this healthy city. Now, if the same individual migrates to a high prevalence city or to an unhealthy environment, then the externality that she will impose in that city is close to zero. Why? Because all the inhabitants of the unhealthy environment would have been infected otherwise. Okay, so now uh, we understand that this kind of sorting is beneficial in terms of decreasing the overall rate of disease. Uh, so what is crucial to minimize the overall rate of disease is that there is a sorting between healthy individuals living in healthy environments and unhealthy individuals living in unhealthy environments. Okay? So now the question is, when does such a sorting happen? And this is what the model is explaining. So if one leaves migration totally un unrestricted, healthy individuals may have higher incentive to live in the healthy city where costs of living are going to be uh, high than unhealthy or sick individuals. <coughs> okay, why? Because unhealthy individuals have already caught the disease, so they are less willing to pay for the high cost of living to be in the, high, uh, in the healthy environment uh, than the uh, healthy individuals. Okay, so this kind of segregation is then beneficial as it decreases the overall prevalence rate of disease. And in this condition, we understand that very strong uh, quarantine measures might be in fact uh, decreasing uh, the welfare overall as it increases uh, the prevalence rate of disease. Okay? So, but this sorting also leads to a higher segregation of healthy individuals living in the healthy city with high cost of living and unhealthy individuals living in the sink of disease with very cheap cost of living. And of course, from this viewpoint, it's very arguable that this is beneficial for the society as a whole since it increases uh, socio-economic and health inequalities across areas. So, of course, the results that I just summarized require some condition to be met, which lead to this beneficial sorting, which is a key, uh, the key element in this explanation. So, but now, if you want to give one very general message from this research to policymakers, so I would warn them that policy measures in the field of uh, public health may have unintended consequences if one does not take into account the fact that individuals and families may move in response to diseases. So uh, there was an example with the quarantine uh, effect. Another example comes from my field work, or our field work in Nigeria, where we are looking at the effects of an intervention which subsidizes health insurance to give access to health, in, uh, to health insurance to poor households. And in fact, we also see that this scheme uh, also provoked the congestion of the health facilities under the scheme and the desertion of the health facilities nearby. And this was clearly not intended. Okay? So this also points out that uh, the objectives of the authorities when they implement policies need to be clarified. So uh, we have seen that if the objective is to diminish the total number of sick individuals, maybe quarantine measures have to be not as strict as they used to be, okay? But, uh, okay, so if it is to get this beneficial sorting, maybe we could free up migration. But on the other hand, if this is at the expenses of increasing, socio increasing socioeconomic inequalities, maybe uh, this is agreeable, yeah. okay? So now maybe the last warning is that it is very difficult to give policy recommendations in general. And uh, in fact, the policy effects that I outlined with our research depend very much on the health problem encountered 
and as well on the context and on how badly policy measures are designed. So interventions in general have very complex effects and policymakers have to take all of them into account when they design their policies. And from this viewpoint, empirical work is essential. So empirical work should be able to quantify the relative importance of uh, different effects. So the direct effect and maybe more side effects, such as the ones that I outlined, and to understand in each setting how people may respond to the policies, which is highly context dependent.